Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for another edition of IRENA Insights webinar series. My name is Arina Anisie. I am from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. For those who are not familiar with IRENA, we are an intergovernmental organization with currently 163 member countries. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as the principal platform for international cooperation, a center of excellence, and the repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Since our analytical work and our engagement with our member generates a lot of valuable insights, we are constantly looking for ways to share those insights with you. And that's why we launched our fortnightly IRENA Insights webinar program in January 2020, even before the pandemic driven the proliferation of online events. So every other week, presenters from one IRENA's team, either alone or together with their invited guests, share with you key findings from their latest work and will offer you insights into opportunities, trends, best practices, but also innovative solutions to address various challenges. We aim to keep these webinars short, circa 30 minutes, so we cannot cover everything, but we do hope that we give you enough to decide whether to delve deeper into the topic. And we signpost our presentations further, uh, further resources of more in-depth information to help you do that. Today's webinar will be about mini grids of the future through renewables innovation and resiliency. Our speakers today will draw on key findings from the recent IRENA report, Quality Infrastructure for Smart Mini Grids, and will discuss the role of quality infrastructure in enabling in uh, the growth of mini grids market. Let me now introduce our speakers. Next slide, please. Yes, today uh, we will hear from Mr. Francisco Bochel, who is ARINA's team lead on, innovate, on renewable uh, energy technology standards and markets, and from our guest, Mr. Vimal Mahendru, who is having multiple hats. One is as president of Leg Legrad in India, but he is also an IEC, International Electrotechnical Commission Ambassador, an India member of the IEC Standardization Management Board, a chair of IEC Systems Committee on Low Voltage Direct Current, also for the electricity access. Their presentation will last maximum 20 minutes to also allow 10 minutes for your questions. But before I uh, hand over the microphone to, to kick off the presentations for today, I have just a few housekeep housekeeping items to cover. Uh, next slide, please. As usual, today's webinar will be recorded and available together with the presentation slides on IRENA's website under past webinars. The previous webinar recordings and slides are already there, so you can look them up. We, we will also share with you the link to the website also in the, in the follow-up email, so you can find it easily. Uh, all of you are currently muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. Next slide, please. We would love to hear from you during today's presentation. If you have any question to our speakers, please send it to us through the question feature that you can find on uh, the webinar panel. We will be monitoring questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our speakers. We also received a quite impressive number of questions through your registrations that we will also try to answer either, either during the presentation or at, at the end. So thank you very much also for the questions already sent. However, due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered. To be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and ways to improve it, and what else we could also cover in the future editions, we will appreciate your, your feedback. So at the end of the webinar, uh, or in a follow-up email, we will share with you a very short uh, survey, which we invite you to complete. And last but not least, if you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in, the, uh, dialing in via the phone, as you can see on, on the slide. And without any further ado, let me kick things off by welcoming Francisco, who is the first presenter. Francisco, over to you. Thank you, Irina. And I'm very happy to briefly introduce to you uh, today Irina's most recent analysis on renewable mini grids entitled Quality Infrastructure for Smart Mini Grids, which uh, we published at the end of last year. Next slide, please. 
And uh, first of all, let us start with an overview of the market for renewable mini grids. <clears throat> As we see on the pie chart, we estimate that there is an installed capacity of more than 4.2 gigawatts of renewable mini grids uh, worldwide. Almost 60% of that capacity comes from mini grids using biomass resources. And this is because those mini grids have larger generation capacities than other renewable energy mini grids, as they are usually linked to, for example, agro industries, such as the sugar cane mills, providing electricity to an industrial uh, complex. Now, the rest of the installed capacity comes in almost equal shares from hydro, wind, and solar PV mini grids. But where we see more growth recently is in photovoltaic mini grids. Now, geographically, almost 90% of all those mini grids are located in Asia Pacific and North America, followed by Europe. And far away, actually last and with a big gap, is Latin America and Africa. So we still see a great untapped potential for renewable mini grids in developing and emerging regions. And in terms of applications, most of these mini grids are now used to electrified remote areas and for commercial and industrial applications. Next slide, please. Now, technology improvements, uh, innovative business models, and an assured quality, these elements are bringing the cost of electricity from those mini grids uh, down. In the last 15 years, we have seen that the cost of electricity from these mini grids have more than halved to nowadays between 40 to 60 US dollar cents per kilowatt hour in remote areas. And as we see on the screen, that is already cost competitive in those remote locations against diesel generation. And in the next uh, 10 years, the cost might further decline to around lower than 20 US dollar uh, uh, cents per kilowatt hour. And even today, in some locations like in California, we are seeing that innovative business models can deliver solar mini grids cost with uh, PPAs around even 14 US dollars per kilowatt hour where some incentives from the government or municipality are in place, such as adding on top of the PPA an annual capacity payment for those mini grids, and also the partial payment of some of the uh, upfront cost uh, for those uh, mini grids. Next slide, please. But renewable mini grids are supporting, in addition to energy access solutions, also solutions for grid connected systems. We see how renewable energy mini grids are being interconnected to the main grid, firstly supporting the viability of the whole power system, as we see, for example, in the case of Nepal with hydro microgrids supporting the main grid. And secondly, as we see on the slide, now renewable mini grids are becoming a new source of flexibility to address the variability of wind and PV in large uh, grids. Uh, by adapting the load profile of the mini grids and using storage and digital technologies, those mini grids can provide services to the main grid, such as frequency response, balancing, and using aggregated distributed energy resources for the man site management. There are some pilot projects already, for example, in the Netherlands, in California, also in Australia with large uh, batteries. Uh, and if the regulatory frameworks in the countries are adjusted, the provision of those services are also potential new sources of revenues, creating new business models for those uh, mini grids. Next slide, please. So as we see on the diagram, those advancements are also based on the more in-depth use of uh, digital technologies, such as Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, which allowed an optimization in the operation of renewable energy mini grids based on the needs of the consumer, but also on the needs of the power system. And another interesting development is the use of direct current instead of alternating current in mini grid applications via low voltage direct current uh, mini grids, a topic that will be discussed by Mr. Bimal uh, Mahendro later in this webinar. Now, as explained in our report, to harness the full benefit of all those innovations, we require sound technical standards to ensure the interoperability, communication between the different devices, and the performance of all the devices connected in a mini grid. Next slide, please. And what we also observe is that renewable energy mini grid systems with an assured quality 
also result in more resilient energy systems. And that's what we have seen, for example, in the case of Puerto Rico after the Hurricane uh, Maria in 2017. But, well, the main grid collapsed in certain zones uh, due to the hurricane. Available mini grids continue to operate and support emergency services needed uh, to attend uh, the situation. And as a result of that, in 2018, Puerto Rico has already reinforced its support to mini grid deployment, but also is strengthening the quality of those systems via the use of technical standards, as we can see on the listed on the screen. So renewable energy mini grids willing to benefit from the government incentives need to comply with the required standards as explained in our report to assure that they would perform as needed during a similar emergency, emergency situations in the future. Next slide, please. Now, a set of robust in, uh, instruments that we have to ensure that mini grids will have an assured quality and deliver the services as we expect is the so-called quality infrastructure, which is illustrated on the slide. And this quality infrastructure includes technical standards, test methods, certification, accreditation. Uh, implementing such a quality infrastructure also mitigates the technical risk for those mini grids and then provides more confidence to the financial sources and the consumers. And that finally attracts more investments. Next slide, please. In our report, we do a very detailed analysis also on what are the available international standards, test methods, certification schemes already available to support the implementation of renewable energy mitigate projects. But we also identified a number of gaps that need to be addressed. For example, as we see on the slide, an important gap is related to the harmonization of communication protocols to better optimize the operation of uh, uh, mini grids using uh, smart meters and advanced weather forecast for photovoltaic mini grids. And another aspect is the need to continue to develop the required standards at international level for low voltage direct current uh, mini grids. In the report uh, that we uh, publish, you will find uh, concrete recommendations on how to address those gaps and engage in the national, international uh, process to discuss uh, such an issues around quality infrastructure. The next slide, please. And in our report, we also provide uh, quite a number of examples on how countries are already using this quality infrastructure to, to be integrated in their legal frameworks uh, and regulations. Like it is, it is the case already mentioned of Puerto Rico, but also uh, Tanzania and other states in the, in the US but also how they are used in policy guidelines for mini grids, like it's already the case in countries like Nigeria or Indonesia. And those examples that you will find <clears throat> will illustrate in your own country context how this quality infrastructure can support a successful implementation of national plans for the deployment of renewable uh, mini grids. Next slide, please. So to summarize the, this very brief introduction to our uh, report, innovative technology, digitalization, and new business models are making renewable energy mini grids already a cost competitive option to bring reliable and affordable electricity to communities in remote areas. But when interconnected with larger grids, they also support a higher resiliency of the whole power system, and now even more flexibility to integrate variable renewables and quality infrastructure, including international standards, testing and certification, are very strong instruments to ensure the bankability and successful deployment of those renewable uh, energy mini grids. But we need to be aware of those instruments and use them in regulations and in policies. And IRENA's report provides a comprehensive and detailed guidance on how to use such a quality infrastructure in benefit of national renewable energy mini grid plans and as mentioned at the beginning, the full report is already available for free in our publications uh, website. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and back to you, Arina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco, for this insightful presentation. Let us jump directly to Vima's presentation and, uh, and then we answer the questions we already received uh, high, <laughs> quite a number. Vimal, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Arena, and uh, uh, thank you, uh, Francisco, for laying the, the platform for me. Next slide, please. Uh, let me begin by posing a question to all of you. This picture was taken by me in 2014 in a village which has never, ever had had electricity. What do you think must be this old man's lifestyle? What must he be doing during the day and then during the night? In 2014, when I visited him, this man's whole life used to be just outdoor when the sun was there. He used to weave bamboo baskets, with bamboo being a local resource, and he would make about 10 baskets sell in the local market. Next, please, sir. In 2017, he got a solar-powered uh, bulb on the roof. Just one small chain, just a bulb inside with this. His life was totally transformer, transformed by this one bulb. What it did was he could, to earn more money, continue to do the weaving indoors. He could do the cooking in the dark. So his daytime productive hours increased. He started earning about 40% extra. Of course, it had a lot of ripple effect because he was able to immediately do one more thing. The moment he got this light bulb and it changed his life, he bought a mobile phone so that he could be in contact with the younger people because in the village, there were only old people left. And without electricity, the whole demographics of this place was being changed. This is the power of uh, electrification. And this is thanks to DC microgrids. Next, please. The World Bank has done seminal work on defining electricity access also. So when we talk of electricity access, it's not binary that either you have it or you don't. The moment there is one light bulb, within six months it is seen that it triggers need for more and more and more. Like the old man, you know, he put in a light bulb first. And for that, you know, a solar lantern is also perhaps adequate. There are already IEC standards for these kind of products. Next, please. The, the work that IEC is doing right now is doing tier two and three standards of the World Bank multi-tier framework. The link is embedded here. This is a very interesting work done by the World Bank, which defines how much electricity is required for a normal, normal household. And countries or utilities which want to implement DC microgrids for electricity access, they may start from tier one by just providing a solar lantern. But soon they see that the need is more like in tier two, where it is still a light bulb, but there is also need for maybe a small fan or a very small 16 inch black and white television. And then going to tier three, where at least for eight hours, there is need for two light bulbs, maybe the simplest of kitchen appliances, a fan and a small television. And this goes on till tier five, where there is assured electricity for at least 23 hours in a day. So DC microgrids or mini grids can also be spanning a large uh, process so that countries and utilities, governments can plan how they will increase their electrification programs. Next slide, please. That was about electrification of huts and homes. These two pictures, uh, three pictures are related to two of the other very important use cases of microgrids, especially in rural interiors. I see the, this in Asia and Africa quite prominently. In India, for example, we have one of the biggest programs for solar PV based DC microgrids for irrigation purposes, which enable people to irrigate the land and the agricultural activi activities. Next, of course, is healthcare. Some of the biggest consumption of electricity in rural areas where DC mini grids are relevant is actually electrification of the village dispensaries and healthcare systems. And the UN is doing a lot of work in this area of electrification of these uh, outlying healthcare centers. Next. 
in india we started this journey of dc uh, microgrids and mini grids around 2014 and these are very recent pictures of uh, villages which are having very remote huts where even connecting two huts or a few huts is difficult so these are isolated locations where just a small solar pv panel is enabling electrification and the, the pictures at the bottom these two pictures show schools where which are totally disconnected from the grid there is the grid is not even planned in some of these villages and yet there is very effective education thanks to the electrification there and there is also computer based knowledge being given to these students next please i don't want to give you the impression that dc microgrids or mini grids are re relevant only for electricity access or rural areas of course they are relevant even in urban spaces uh, the picture on the right of your screen is from amsterdam where abn amro bank one of their latest buildings is totally wired for dc and in fact it it, it is interesting that if you bring your normal laptop over there uh, uh, as a visitor and you want to connect you have to go to the reception to get an adapter so that you could convert dc into ac so that it could power the adapter which converts it again back to dc and you can use it look at the wastage of electricity there the the picture at the bottom is of uh, dc greenhouses which are uh, off grid uh, greenhouses and also of data centers where there is a lot of consumption of direct current and there are now uh, uh, dc data centers which have solar pv panels outside on the rooftops or on the parking lots and from there feeding direct current straight away into the computer systems next please but dc also has some challenges our knowledge of alternating current is developed over 130 years but dc what you and i grew up uh, studying in our science uh, uh, books in school was just a straight line this was how direct current was defined just unidirectional but thanks to electronics next slide please dc itself has changed thanks to electronics in the last 40 years or so all kinds of waveforms are possible in, in dc so this is the phase when even dc is being known as digital electricity because digitally things are being changed and as microgrids have evolved thanks to batteries uh, and varied power sources sources electronics is making a big impact even in safety and development of dc microgrids next so dc microgrid standardization sometimes is also a challenge and this is what iec is trying to uh, address right now think about it this way there every village in the world is kind of unique in its own ways the topology of the village how spaced the huts are between them what is the nature of usage of electricity inside the huts and if there is productive requirement of electricity either for solar pv based uh, uh, irrigation or shops or uh, agricultural produce uh, processing or meat processing or just supporting the local economy there are so many different vari variables that every village or a cluster of huts is unique and so we are trying to develop standards right from the scratch where we are creating in a way a repository of all kinds of use cases trying to bunch them together look at the common themes of all that is being is visible to us standardizing voltages and parameters of quality and safety uh, obviously nobody wants dc microgrids to be unsafe they have to assure us of the same level of safety as ac microgrids are and that's where a lot of the effort is going next let me also show you a, a, a demo of this challenge that i'm seeing 
both pictures on your screen. The one on the left shows an old lady with a push cart. This is in India, actually, in Bangalore, where she has a small solar PV panel and she has a fan to roast the corn. And the one on the right is taken in one of the smartest cities in the world, in Singapore, where public spaces have fans connected directly to solar PV panels on the rooftop. Both are microgrids, both very effective. This gives you the uh, a perspective on the relevance of direct current for microgrids. Next. I want to conclude with this uh, slide by saying, IEC is already working on standardization of DC microgrids. The more you demand, the more you get engaged, better it is because then the IEC experts can actually deliver solutions which take into consideration your needs. And that, I think, would make all the difference. I would definitely encourage you to get engaged. Uh, next, please. And I conclude with this last slide, which has links to some of the work that has been done by IEC on DC microgrids, uh, on direct current itself, the LinkedIn group we have, and some of the other information. Back to you, uh, Arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francisco and Vimal, for these very important and great presentations. Um, we have received a number of questions, and I'm happy to tell that I hope many of the questions have already been answered by you in the presentation. I saw a lot of comments regarding what uh, is a DC mini grid, what is a mini grid, uh, how small it is a mini grid. I hope you, you already heard the answers in the excellent presentation of our speakers. So uh, I am trying to, to address as many as possible, and I clustered them. Uh, a little bit. So I would suggest we have a lot of questions regarding the isolated mini grids for energy access in particular. So I would address the first question or, or set of questions to Vimal, maybe to comment a little bit of um, uh, should communities pay for the mini grids or do you do we see public or private support necessary? Are countries supporting that? Uh, in other words, are these mini grids for energy access already uh, economically feasible. We, we saw that the costs are down, but is that enough? Um, and maybe coupled to this also, we can address uh, something about the importance of uh, batteries for such mini grids in, uh, for energy access. And what is actually the difference between PICO, um, wait a second, about these PICO systems with just one bulb and uh, the transition towards more um, developed mini grids where people can actually uh, trade with each other also in this kind of settings. So it's a lot of questions around uh, electricity access and how this evolves. If you want to pick up on, on some of those. <laughs> Thank you. Normally I would take two hours, but a short answer to this is, I think a hint to you also, Francisco, let's do another short webinar where we can specially take up uh, electricity access related DC microgrids. Coming to your first question around, is this economically feasible, etc. My feeling coming from the technology perspective, I think the technology is there today that uh, DC microgrids in the off-grid environment are already at parity with electricity at the grid level. The challenge is not really the cost of electricity because the consumers, let's say in those electricity access situations, today they get electricity by either uh, lighting by candles or kerosene lamps or uh, even firewood. They, if they replace it with, uh, let's say, an LED bulb, which is from a solar lantern or even from a DC mini grid, the savings is enough to uh, savings of not buying candles or kerosene oil is enough to take care of uh, the payment for this the challenge comes the upfront cost who will spend on the solar pv panels and etc and this is where government support in developing economies is very important and i think that should be the policy to go forward in india also the government is having a massive program to roll out where the government is providing financial support for setting up electricity access programs, but that support is purely for the infrastructure. The operational cost 
comes from the consumers who pay for electricity. Okay. The, there was another question regarding regarding technology, which was about I think uh, grid connected and the definitions, etc. Interestingly, there there is no uniform definition that I have come across between mini grid, micro grid, uh, pico grid, etc. And one of the tasks we have taken up in IEC, actually in my committee also, is to clearly define these terms so that everyone can use them uh, uniformly. If there was anything that I've missed, maybe we can go to the next question or go back to you, Arena. Thank you, Vimal. Yes, no, very, very good clarification. I will go now a little bit indeed to, to talk about grid connection, mini grid, because there are a series of questions related to this. And maybe I will turn to Francisco here. <laughs> and the question sounds um, like what, um, uh, what are the challenges result, resulting from uh, interference and connected uh, mini grid to the main grid? And is there any regulatory problem? Uh, there are some questions mentioning that the utility sometimes might not agree or might put some burden on the condition on on the connection of the mini grids with uh, with the main grid. And uh, yes, how do you see this? Uh, complementarity between mini grids and the, and the large grids and the, the inter relationship between them so thank you arena yeah uh, this is a, a quite interesting uh, question an emerging trend no, of having mini grids interconnected to the grid and i think there are at least three perspectives we have to take into account the first one is the one of course of the end user or the consumer and it's clear that uh, consumers are now more interested to be empowered to produce their own electricity and use their own clean electricity uh, instead of being importing or uh, buying electricity for the main, from the main grid. Also because in some countries, as mentioned before, uh, these systems ensure also the reliability of the power supply and also is cleaner uh, and, let's say, have some savings in the tariff. So this is a trend that is ongoing. Yeah. Now, the, the second perspective is the perspective of, um, let's say, the, the, the power system. No? And from the power system, what we have to keep in mind is that uh, mini grids are now also uh, an opportunity to uh, provide services that are required by these uh, larger grids, even more now that we are transitioning to uh, high penetrations of wind and PV. And as mentioned before, we see that mini grids can provide certain services, for example, aggregating demand, distributed energy resources to provide, for example, frequency uh, control, balancing, or uh, reduce congestion, especially at distribution uh, level system. So these uh, benefits should be uh, say compensated and monetized in a way that also improve the business case for mini grids. But of course, the third aspect also is the responsibility and liability of the distribution system operators and the regulatory implications, meaning that in any case, if you have a, a mini grid that will be interconnected to the grid, someone is still responsible for the infrastructure, for the cables, for the transformer, the switchers. And they also need to continue to be compensated for those uh, uh, services and those uh, responsibilities. Yeah? So what we are seeing now is that we are in a learning stage where we are seeing, seeing even some regulatory sandboxes trying to understand what would be the right tariff structure, for example, that would allow these uh, mini grids to have the compensated for the services, but still also pay for the services provided by the distribution system operators. Final word is, for example, here in Europe, the concept of a, a community energy is getting stronger and stronger. But the main discussion now is exactly that regulatory aspect, is how we can do it in a way that is fair for the consumer, but also fair for the system operator who continues to be liable and responsible for the infrastructure. So there are uh, uh, ways out, uh, uh, as I said, uh, different tariff structures, compensation, etc. But this is the ongoing uh, discussion. So technically, it's possible. Now it's a discussion about regulatory aspects. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I hope this clarifies all, all the questions related to, to this 
was a very comprehensive answer. I, I'm looking at the, at the time and I see we don't have much, but I will allow to take three more minutes maybe for a last question for each of our speakers, because there are so many questions and I want to steer a little bit more the discussion towards quality infrastructure and standards. And uh, um, maybe I will uh, start uh, this with Francisco and then another question from Vimal. Uh, Francisco. Do international standards address the impact of extreme weather conditions uh, cases like hurricanes on mini grids? And there was also a question about standards for communication protocols, if you have any insight on that. Thanks, Arina. Yeah, on, on, on the extreme weather conditions. So international standards, of course, they, they accommodate different weather conditions in their standards. So there are different classifications for wind and, and for PV as well, where you have class one, two, three, depending on the on the type of, of, of climate and weather conditions they will face. However, due to climate change and also that markets are moving to different regions, we are seeing certain aspects in, 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 in extreme weather conditions that are actually not fully addressing international standards yet. For example, now that there are more uh, applications in the Middle East, for example, where we have really extreme ambient temperatures, or in Southeast Asia with very high humidity, or in deserts like in Chile with very high UV variation. Those parameters maybe are not fully covered yet international standards, but now there is a big effort in these international standardization bodies to engage with researchers and industry from those regions to also integrate these aspects. So I would say, yes, international standards cover these aspects, but we are still in a learning phase for these new emerging markets with have uh, different weather conditions that were not the ones originally used to design this PV or wind system and therefore incorporated international standards. And uh, the, the, what was the second part of the question, Arina? Sorry, I... About communication protocols, if there are already yeah. standards for communication protocols, yes. Yes, there are standards. Uh, the issue is now harmonization between different standards. So we have different also standardization bodies and national standardization bodies which use different, maybe a, a little bit different protocols. So we have industry standards, such as, for example, the IEEE, we have national standards, like, for example, DIN or TUV or UL, and we have international standards like IEC. So there are standards. That's not the issue. Now, the issue is that uh, for some of these applications, we need to harmonize these standards. So basically, what a vendor is proposing for the US market or for the Australian market can also be used in Europe, in Latin America, or in Africa, therefore reducing the cost and the need for additional devices and equipment. So this is still the effort that is needed in that area. Thank you very much. Vimal, if you have anything to add, I will give you now the opportunity to add something. And yes. I also have an extra question for you. So uh, okay. you can. So a quick sentence on what uh, Francisco shared. And while I totally agree, I think two things are happening. As we are seeing over the last 30 years, natural disasters are increasing in number and in intensity. So is the standardization community also tightening the standards and responding to these challenges. I see in IEC a lot of work now being done to really address the severity of weather and climate change taking place and trying to see how we can address it through building and assuring resilience of the electrical networks. I think this is across the board, but definitely so also for mini grids and micro grids. The second, I mean, it was music to my ears when Francisco said uh, harmonization, because of course, IEC is the biggest platform in the world for these kind of technical standards. And this is our endeavor that all the standards are harmonized, that you by any device from anywhere in the world, as long as it is in made to IEC standards, it's applicable all over the world. Today, IEC standards are used by 96% of the population in the world. The mobile phone that we carry in our pockets, this has at least 100 standards which are impacting the technologies that go into it. So be sure that harmonization is critical and already IEC and the other standardization organizations are addressing it. Now the quick question. Yes, the last question that goes very well. It's a bit challenging. 
so there are many different standards available uh, worldwide for mini grids, as we have seen. Now, what is unique about IEC standards? Why should this be followed? And uh, maybe you can also incorporate something in your answer about DC mini grids uh, standards and when they will be ready. Okay. So quickly, let me take the second part first. DC mini grid standards, we are already working on it. The first set of standards, which is related to tier two and three, which I showed in my slide deck, uh, those will be ready later this year. It got little delayed because of uh, the COVID-19, but later this year. And in the coming year, then we'll be working on tier four and five. So be sure that this is an urgent need, not only in India where I am, but also uh, across a lot of countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and we're working on this. So that's regarding the stand standards. Uh, what is the first part of your question? Sorry. Why we should all follow uh, IEC standards uh, when there are Great so many question. available standards? So if you look at it, the unique difference that IEC brings to the table or to the world of standardization is there are only three organizations whose standards are endorsed by countries and also used by the World Trade Organization for managing international trade. They are ITU, the International Telecom Union, ISO, International Standards Organization for the Management Standards, and for technology, especially electrotechnology, communication technologies, etc., it's IEC standards. These standards today are accepted in about 165 countries of the world, which cover practically 96% of the global population. And this is the reason why I feel one standard may not be very different from another, but if you go with IEC standards, then you can be fairly assured that wherever you buy the equipment from or to wherever you sell the equipment or you use different parts, solar PV panels coming from one and uh, batteries coming from another country, they will work with each other provided it is with IEC standards. And because it is about countries, it's not so much about individual companies or manufacturers pushing their specific standards. It is the nations which get involved in developing these standards and then adopting these. It's all about harmonization. Great, Absolutely. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Unfortunately, the time is up. Actually, we took extra 10 minutes, so I, I apologize for that, but it has been such an interesting discussion. We have received many nice questions. Maybe we will follow up on uh, on Vima's proposal uh, to have a follow up webinar to discuss more about this topic. It's uh, obviously a topic of uh, great interest for all. So thank you very much again, Francisco and Vimal, for sharing your insight and experience uh, today with us. And uh, let me go uh, to our final two announcements before closing uh, this webinar. Next slide, please. Well, as mentioned in the beginning of the webinar, we would like to invite you to complete a very short satisfactory survey, which will appear at the end of the webinar. We would like to thank you in advance for taking the time and uh, let, us, uh, let, uh, let us know how you liked it. Um, then uh, we would also like to invite you uh, on our next edition on, uh, on webinars. We have uh, this Thursday, a joint webinar with two TSOs, one TSO in Germany, Transnet's double, uh, BW, and uh, a utility in Costa Rica, ICE. Uh, and we will uh, talk about the innovation for operating power system with increasing share of variable renewables. So if you're interested, uh, there is still time to register. We, you will find the event on IRENA website under event. And uh, then we will have another uh, series. We will continue the Insight series webinar. On the 23rd of February, we will talk about skill building for the energy transition. We will present a, a short brief that IRENA is releasing on, uh, on this topic. And then in March, we will kick uh, off with a series of hydrogen uh, webinars, one focusing more on uh, policy making for green hydrogen, and the second on 23rd of March on uh, looking more at the costs for electrolyzing and uh, uh, yeah, how to scale up electrolyzers. So thank you very much again. You will find uh, all the links. You can already register to all these webinars. Uh, next slide, please. In, um, 
in these links here that you can also uh, we will also send the slides to you and uh, thank you again for joining have a great rest of the day bye bye thank you very much bye bye